and my big fear is, I, mean, I don't have my phone, I don't really, I don't have a phone, so she goes off without me, but I'm like, all right, I'm on my own. <laughs> Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In episode 5, the previous deep dive, we stopped at roughly the 13 minute mark where Brian Laundry communicated his unwillingness to drink bottled water. This was despite the fact that it was a very hot day. In this episode, we're going to deal with the next two minutes from 13 to 15 minutes and something very interesting comes up in this episode. It is where Brian tells a very blatant and obvious lie. Why does he do it? Well, we're going to find out. Before we get to episode 6, bear in mind there are five other episodes in the series. And I think all of them contain insights of their own. So make sure you go through all of them. If you find this episode interesting, try and go through the entire series and get yourself caught up. If you're not already a subscriber to the channel, please subscribe, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So if you missed episode 5, what we were trying to communicate, the thing that we were trying to absorb was this idea of Brian Laundrie as a sort of OCD person, someone with a higher degree of anality, and that would mean a greater potential for sadism. Think of anality as being very OCD, very particular, very controlling, very self-limiting. And one of the, one of the things we see uh, a symptom of that is Brian being absolutely adamant that he's not going to drink bottled water, even though it's a hot day, even though they're thirsty, even though it's being offered to him. And I think it was even refrigerated. In a sense, anality is inner directed. In other words, it's self-limiting. It's your own protocols, your own rules. But it may also be outward directed. You may also be anal in terms of other people telling them what they can and cannot do, particularly in an intimate relationship scenario. Essentially, it's an attempt to constrict the world to fit into your notion of what the world is. Sadism is how the an anality expresses itself when the world doesn't fit into your shoebox. If anality is all about not doing certain things, sadism is about what you well doing, what you shouldn't do. It, is often, it often expresses itself through violence, manipulation or coercion and may start off with harsh snapping language. In a sense, the summer epic itself was a kind of anal journey where the passengers elected to go without by choice, only to discover that going without wasn't much fun, wasn't very romantic and was still very costly. And so within this self-limiting framework, a sense of wanting to break out of the constricting psychology began to take place, then escalated until finally fatal violence erupted. With that out of the way, let's start with our deep dive into this episode and we kick off at around about the 13 minute mark of the body cam. You'll notice at this point Brian is fending off three to four different officers with his story. And this is actually a very important part because this is where he is telling his version of why they are having an argument. What I was saying, oh, it's okay, thank you so much. As long as it's cold, that's good. <laughs> um, so it was, just, it was just more of a disagreement than I just wanted to say. What was the disagreement about? It was, it was, I wouldn't even call it disagreement. It was just that I'm dirty and I can't change being dirty. Like I got dirty feet, I got sand in my flip and stuff like that. Um, it was that we were at the coffee shop for so long because we were there from nine to three. So yeah, there's a few little little things, little just little relationships. I don't know if you have a relationship with three. I've been married for over five years now. So. There's a lot of little things. Right? Yeah, yeah, I can go. Um, and we, we, I get it. We really, it was, we weren't physical before the point where I said, all right, let's let's just take a breather and, and like walk away for a minute. I'll lock the van up and I'll go for a walk this way, and you can go walk that way on the block. You know, because okay. moon. Uh, so when you play that in real time, it is very difficult to keep track of what he's saying. He's giving out quite a lot of information, but it's because it's quite difficult to make out over the sound of the engine. Uh, we kind of kind of get lost and it's sort of like, well, what did he say? I caught that word and I caught that word. Essentially, when we slow it down, we find out that Brian said, so we had a little disagreement there. 
she was getting a little worked up and I'd say, so it was just a small disagreement and I just wanted, and that is when I think he sort of interrupted where Robbins asks, asks him, Officer Robbins asks, what was the disagreement about? Now, bear in mind, he's already minimizing it. He's calling it a little disagreement. She was a little worked up. And then again, he says small disagreement. He's trying to say it's not a big deal. But at the same time, Brian's minimizing the argument. He's not making eye contact. There aren't three and later four officers on the scene because it was a little disagreement. Obviously, it wasn't a little disagreement if it prompted even a public reaction, including someone actually calling 911 to report it. To his credit, as I say, Officer Robbins interrupts him and kind of says in a pointed but necessary way, he says, what was the disagreement about? And yet it's quite interesting looking at Brian's body language. He is sort of not making eye contact again. And he sort of stutters. He says, it was, it was. Brian looks down, sort of throws his arms around. And and then he sort of motions to his feet and smiles. And I guess he's feeling a bit embarrassed. And this is important because what he's admitting here is some error on his part. And when he does that, he smiles. When he's admitting some error on his part, he smiles. We also know Brian smiled throughout the middle to latter part of the Moab incident. He started off not really smiling much, but as it went on, he smiled more and more and more. And it, it was not so much, I think, because he admitted what he didn't, what he what he did wrong, but because he didn't, because he didn't want to. So if we slow down, we, we sort of go to the transcript. Brian says, I wouldn't even call it a disagreement. We just, uh, I'm dirty and I can't change being dirty. I've got dirty feet. I've got sand in my, and then there's, it's a bit inaudible. You can't quite make out what he's saying. And then he says stuff like that. It was a little bit inaudible again. And then he says coffee shop so long from nine till three. There are a few little things. And then he kind of gestures with his fingers, kind of showing how small these little things are. And Brian then asks the officer if, you know, if he's been in a relationship and Robbins responds, I've been married for five years now. It's easy to miss here because many men and women will acknowledge that generally men are dirtier and women are cleaner and women want a cleaner home and cleanliness from their partners. I actually had dinner tonight with my family and I was sitting there in kind of my, not my gym clothes, but I'd swum in the gym a little bit earlier and not a big session, just a small little swim. And I was sitting there kind of still with wet, um, wet, wet swimming trunks on. Not a really good idea. Even my girlfriend said so because I, you know, I would, I, I haven't been feeling that great. Um, anyway, and so I was not really dressed the way that my girlfriend, I guess, approved of. But that does often happen. And in Brian's story, he portrays himself as the innocent victim. His only mistake is that he's dirty. Gabby never mentions Brian being dirty when she's asked, you know, what is she upset about? She, she says she's upset because he locked her out of the van. And she was upset because he didn't. And I think also because of the way he threw the groceries or the food into the back, something like that. The untidiness of that aspect. Um, I'm not saying that she wasn't upset about it, but he's highlighting something that I don't know if if it was as big a deal to her as he's making out. It's not, there was something else that was a bigger deal to her. And think about it, she's upset actually because he didn't believe in or agree with what she was doing in terms of her work. In the scheme of things, Brian being dirty is a small thing, but the mistake made by the officers here um, it's easy enough to do was to take his story at face value, not to sort of dig deeper, not to think about, well, but Gabby said that. The thing that I think stands out in a deep dive like this is uh, Brian um, communicated his own little things, such as not wanting to drink bottled water. These little things are part of a bigger thing, which is Brian imposing his world on Gabby. He's in a relationship. He's with a fiance at close quarters and seems to have decided being earthy and barefooted is more important than being clean and not smelling while on a long-distance trip with his fiancée. 
The other thing that I think is easy to miss is is part of the brief of the summer epic. They're supposed to be communicating how perfect their van life journey is. In the footage we've seen, the interior of the van and the van lifers themselves, um, it, it is invariably neat, clean and tidy. If you go and watch the uh, nomadic static video, when you see the inside of the van, when you see Gabby, everything is actually quite neat and they part of the premise of what they're trying to do is provide hacks to effective and enjoyable van lifing right so brian's insistence on being dirty isn't going to play well on social media as long as he's dirty and the van is a mess they're not going to be really be able to spontaneously film what they're doing they're not really setting an example for the ideal van life journey and I guess another way to compare it is if you take the Chris Watts case and Shanann, Shanann would always present herself. She would be very clean, made up, looking happy uh, in order to present, to, to, to sell her story. And it's not really going to work in a situation like that if someone is dirty and looking sort of tired and things are a mess. You know, you're trying to show that this is a um, perfect summer epic and this is our secret to secret tips for for getting there now on the one hand you could say brian was being authentic and he had every right to do that but the fact is that they, they were actually there to do a job if you compare this to van gogh's summer epic he was also there to do a job he was there to paint so if, if van gogh had kind of gone through his summer epic and just not painted it would also have been you know like what are you doing here and so that is the question we're kind of asking Brian. So Brian also let slip a gripe here that they were at the coffee shop for a long time from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon. That's around six hours. It's a long time. But YouTubers and influencers have to put a lot of time. Uh, they've got to invest a lot of time to sort through images, get their stories straight. Uh, some, for some of them, write scripts. I, I'm one of those. Um, organize their digital platforms it's hard to know whether Brian was helpful in this area or whether he was more focused on sort of um, monkeying around. This to me shows not only Brian's immaturity, but his hypocrisy. While he feels they have a schedule to keep, you know, he, he wants to sort of get going, I guess, so that they can get to the arches or whatever. Gabby is consciously trying to earn and make money. She's, she's doing what they need to be doing. She's working. And think about it, after murdering Gabby, what does Brian do? What's the first thing he does? He takes Gabby's money, money he's been too lazy, too immature, or even too stupid to earn himself. You know, he's not a, he hasn't applied himself in the same way Gabby has. He hasn't applied himself in the same conscientious way Gabby has in terms of working while they're on this trip. Incidentally, in some of the true crime cases we've covered, the first thing the men do after murdering their demanding partners in, in the, from their perspective is steal their money. We see it with Chris Watts. It's alleged with Barry Morphew. It's also part of the true crime fabric in the Laurie Vallow and Chad Daybell case, or seems to be. In the latter case, you have a man and a woman accused of trying to turn dead bodies into cash in a manner of speaking. This suggests an inability to do the hard work and make money properly like the rest of us. Do you see what I'm, where I'm going? So I want you to think of Brian on the one hand who's dirty and impatient to get going, but with all the time on his hands, he still doesn't seem to wash, doesn't get water, and seems okay with wasting everyone's time. You know, in terms of when they at the stop at the Moab incident, he's now not going to get water even though he needs water. He's now going to waste everyone's time to get water where it suits him, you know, not in a plastic bottle even though the circumstances are such that he does need water. So one wonders whether he refuses to use b bottled water to wash as well. In this sense, and bear in mind, when you're in a van and you're going long distance, there's certain things you're going to do that are unusual, you know, in terms of um, your visits to the bathroom and washing and so, so on. You're going to need to adapt. And so... Brian's little arguments are a form of OCD where he feels he has a right to um, he has a right to be OCD because he thinks his beliefs are right. But you can see how this, in a more general sense, can lead to him being a controlling person. 
The part he's forgetting is if Gabby doesn't want to be controlled, just as he doesn't want to be controlled, and she doesn't like being controlled, just as he doesn't. And so once the control goes beyond a certain point, she may not want to be with him to begin with. She may realize, well, if you weren't here, I might actually enjoy this a lot more because I would have a bit more freedom. I could be myself. If I needed water, I could get it and other things. But because he's used to the control, he doesn't see that coming, except here and there are signs that his control is slipping. And this brings out the sadism, the coercion, the manipulation. And so it's also interesting his language where Brian says, we weren't physical before the point where I said, let's just take a breather and like walk away for a minute. And I'll go for a walk this way and you go for a walk that way. Well, if only Brian used that psychology instead of murdering Gabby. Brian portrays himself as the balanced one, the one who can let go of Gabby, but I'm not sure he was. There's a 15-second stretch from, I think it's about 13.45 to the 14-minute mark, where the sound of the vehicle sort of drowns Brian out almost completely, arguably during one of the most critical parts of his story. If there's a lesson for law enforcement from this footage, it's turn the effing car off and make sure your body cam is actually picking up the effing audio. Just past the 14-minute mark, Brian mentions Gabby having the keys and her phone. The impression one has uh, is that he's been hanging around impatiently for hours uh, you know, at the Moonflower Market and it's become too much and too long. He's had enough and he either tries to take her phone or the keys or both. As a YouTube creator myself, I can tell you my partner is often unhappy and resentful at the amount of time I'm unavailable, working. The difference is I don't ask her to leave her work early or to abandon something she's doing at work to pay attention to me. I think there's a perception that m making a living on social media is still leisure time, that you know, you know, when you're dealing with comments that you are sort of just, I don't know, playfully interacting like, like some people do. But it's not the same as simply being on social media. So that might have been a mindset that was difficult for Brian to adjust to, especially, um, you know, I don't know if he was the proper partner on the project um, that he should have been or that he could have been or that he ought to have been. So we now go to five seconds past the 14 minute mark and we've got 55 seconds to a minute left in our analysis and here we see the third officer join the huddle seemingly checking messages on his phone off the side of Robbins's body cam and it's very important with this body cam to look at the context from the perspective of what is the person who's talking the person who's the suspect, I guess, in the case, what is he seeing? What is in his fabric? What is in his peripheral vision? What is going on around him when he's saying things, when he's being asked certain things? And because context is so important. And so it's not clear whether it's the pressure of this audience of now three officers all listening to him. But it's at this point right here, where Brian tells a blatant lie. It's at um, about five seconds past the 14 minute mark. She got a little worked up and she had a phone in her hand and her keys and everything. And she wanted, not her keys, her, her rings. Mm -hmm. She had her rings, her phone. And I, well, I was holding on to the keys because I just, I didn't want to go anywhere. And my big fear is, I, mean, I don't have my phone, I don't really, I don't have a phone. So mm -hmm. she goes off without me. But I'm, like, All right. I'm on my own. <laughs> so, uh, I was saying, let's just go for a walk, and she was trying to get the keys for me, so I was just going, hey, just wait back up, back up, and it doesn't... So if you followed this case and you've missed that particular moment, you can be forgiven because it's not very clear because of the background noise. And as I say, context is important. The officers ought to have been aware of this as well. And in future policing, you really want to make sure that you can hear what somebody's saying when you kind of interviewing them. But anyway, he says, I, my big fear is, then he glances at Officer Pratt's phone. That's at around about 14.07. Um, and he says, I don't have a phone. So the officer kind of reaches into his pocket, takes out his phone, 
And now remember, Brian's been asked, why did you argue, right? And it's at this point that he comes up with a, with a story. I don't have a phone. And then Officer Pratt reaching for his phone seems to pro prompt Brian with an idea. And he turns the idea of being abandoned by Gabby into a big deal. But then a few seconds later, there's a big fat laugh about it. That's at 1414. And here's the problem. Brian did ultimately abandon Gabby, and in the worst possible way. Brian did ultimately use her phone to manipulate her family into thinking he had nothing to do with what happened to her. That played a big role in what was going on. Also, Brian does have a phone. Brian does have his own phone. So there's a point around about, I think it's half an hour after this, might even be 40 minutes after this, where um, the officers ask for Gabby's phone. Brian goes to the van, reaches into the passenger, um, sort of the side of the passenger door, and takes Gabby's phone. At the same time, he also seems to put something into his pocket. But at any, in any event, there's a point where Gabby's got her phone and he's got his phone, and it's very clear that he has his own phone. And so 40 minutes, something like 40 minutes after saying, you know, very unambiguously, I don't have a phone, we see that he does have a phone. And I think the only reason Brian came up with this lie was because the truth wasn't good enough. So his story seems to be they weren't arguing. Gabby was the problem because he didn't have a phone and she was threatening to leave him without a phone. But in reality, he was in control and likely threatening her. I mean, the scenario is firstly what bystanders saw was him in the van with the keys and her on the outside trying to get in. She was being abandoned in that situation. She didn't have the keys. I imagine he said something like this to her. You know, we've been here for hours. You've had enough time to work. I'm leaving now. If you don't come with me, I'm leaving you. I'm leaving you here and you can finish your effing work without me standing around, twiddling my thumbs kind of thing. You know, I've had enough. I'm going. You can come with me or stay here, but I'm going kind of thing. The other thing to consider is Brian leaving Gabby at the hotel in Salt Lake City. Then he leaves her in the dirt at Grand Tetons a couple of weeks after that. So, you know, Brian is talking about he's so worried about the fact that she's going to leave him in terms of drive away. But that is actually what he does with her. And the real bugbear for Brian wasn't him being left in the way he was portraying, but that their relationship was hanging on by such a thin thread that either one seemed to be imminently about to leave the other. Brian simply didn't want to be the one it happened to because he was so anal, because he needed total control. And so it's very easy, again, to miss these really, really important words where Brian says, if she goes off without me, I'm on my own. If she goes off without me, I'm on my own. This is Brian at his most sort of merry. He's in full chuckle and guffaw mode, but I think all of that merriness is masking how he really feels. I think because how he really feels is terrified and very afraid, very anxious that Gabby is going to leave him. And I think she he deserves to be left. And Gabby's going to leave him not the way he ends up leaving her, but electing to no longer be with him, which is kind of worse in a way, in his mind. You know, wanting to live her life with someone else, wanting to live her life just not with him. That is a fear he cannot bear. But it has nothing to do with keys or a phone. It has everything to do with Brian being a controlling jerk and Gabby realizing as much. Now, think about it. In Brian's story, he tells Gabby to go for a walk, but insists on keeping the keys. When she tries to get the keys from her, he motions, demonstrates, pushing her away. This is on the body cam. Uh, and now it becomes clear why he's lying and why he needs to lie. He needs to have a reason to have the keys, firstly. And secondly, why, if she wants them, he won't give them to him. If he doesn't have a phone, it makes sense. If he does have a phone and is holding onto the keys, it means he's a cruel, ruthless, a, and the next word is whole. And he's forcing her into submission 
you know, what he's doing here, forcing her into submission, is a way of punishing her for not being more compliant. This is the sadistic side of him coming out, and clearly he can't admit this to the cops. Bear in mind he's got to be very careful with his story because he knows the cops have gone to speak to Gabby, right? So he's got to sort of tell a version that is somewhat consistent with that, and this is where he comes up with the phone version. Of course, if the cops had their thinking caps on, they'd say it's more dangerous for a young woman to be abandoned out in the wilderness, just as he was, than for a man with or without a phone to find himself kicking his heels. So in other words, if Gabby did leave him out there without a phone, he'd actually be okay. She wouldn't be. She would be more vulnerable. And look at what happened to those two other women um, in Moab, you know, around about that time. Two women were vulnerable. And, and who killed them? You know, was it a male or a female? Well, likely a male. So it's just a fact of life. Females are far more vulnerable. It doesn't mean if a female hits a male that that doesn't mean anything, but the fact is females are far more vulnerable. And, were, and we saw that again in this story. And so what Brian has done here is inverted Gabby's situation and applied it to himself, making himself the victim. Because the cops are perhaps struggling to hear of the sound of the vehicle, and because there are three of them, and because they might be applying the psychologies in their own relationships to this one, they miss Brian's manipulations. Brian laughing makes him seem more emotionally balanced than Gabby, but in reality, he's more unbalanced, much more unbalanced, and he's smiling while explaining his biggest fear, when you'd expect him to be somber and serious and sincere, is a red flag that they miss. And now let's go to the next point. It's at 24 minutes, 24 seconds past the 40 minute mark. I did I didn't get, I don't want to push you, but I didn't get very, I didn't get overtly physical. I was just trying to keep her away and, and not get hit. And then I got really loud and like that's probably your everyone's attention where I was going. Yeah. Back up, get away, just give me a... Okay, so, so you I, said you pushed her to create some distance, obviously, yeah. right? What happened after that? What so what Brian says here is, I didn't get very, and then he cuts himself off and says, I didn't get overtly physical. And overtly is kind of a strange word for, for this. It's kind of a formal word for what he's talking about. Overt. I wasn't overtly physical. Um, I think he corrects himself because he's going to say, I didn't get very physical, meaning... I did get physical, I just didn't get very physical. And then they would say, well, what did you do? So anyway, the thing is he did get overtly physical. He got overtly physical with himself when he took himself into the wilderness and took himself out. He got overtly physical when he murdered Gabby. The fact that she wasn't simply strangled but struck several times. You know, they mentioned blunt force trauma in the autopsy. Poor girl, I mean, it shows what was done to her was overtly physical. I think it's also clear that he got overtly physical during the Moab incident, given Gabby's injuries to her arms and left cheek, and also given the nature of a scenario where someone is locked out of a vehicle and trying to get in over someone else. That, by its very nature, is an overtly physical wrestling match. It's that physical thing of locking someone out of a vehicle, keeping someone out of a certain space, and then trying to get in. It is overtly physical. It's also interesting to note that through much of this footage, between 13 and 15 minutes, Brian seems to cover his right hand with his left. Um, remember, when driving, his right hand is the one closest to Gabby. Anyway, Brian talks about, and then I got really loud, and that was when witnesses saw something. Robin says, okay, so you say you pushed her to create some distance, obviously. What happened after that? Officer Robbins asked now about the scratches under his eye. How did he get that? And so once again, the officer's almost got to remind Brian, get him back to, so you are telling me a story. Well, how did you get these injuries? Brian doesn't of his own say, this was happening, that was happening, and that was when this happened to me. Um, the officer's got to kind of get him back to like, well, in front of me, you are standing here and there's an injury. How did that injury happen? Is it, in other words, he's got to bring him back to reality. Bring his story back to the facts. Look at the scratches. Okay, so you said you pushed her to create some distance, obviously, right? 
the phone. The phone. So you push her and she hit you. She was. I wasn't. I, it wasn't like a push and she jumped. I mean, she was. She was already. She was already. I don't want to. She was already swinging and I was pushing. Multiple. Yeah. A lot of angles, a lot of nails, a lot of rings. Yeah. You got three scratches in your neck. You got one on your left side of your head. So again, in case you missed it, Brian says that sh- the phone is, is what hit him in the face. Brian seems to backtrack now because where they are is he's told the cops he pushed Gabby and then she struck him in the face with her phone, almost like he pushes her and then she hits him through the face with her phone. But that's also going to get her into serious trouble. Brian seems to have cottoned on to that, and so he tries to minimize this version by saying, Oh, it wasn't really a push. She was already on to me. So it's kind of like he's saying, you know, we're not separated. We are almost like on one another. In other words, physically on one another. And so if you think about that, is that not overtly physical? And this ought to have been another red flag for the officers. Brian weaseling out of the explanation he's just given. He adds, smiling, I don't want to... and." What he's trying to get at there is blame Gabby. There's another point where he also says it's almost like he wants to push the one officer to demonstrate how he pushed Gabby, but then he says, oh, I I don't want to do that. But the fact that he wants to do that, to actually push somebody, is showing that he, to what extent he really was physical. And, you know, the fact that he wants to show it by doing it just shows to what extent that is almost innate with him you know it's it's the way that he wants to be he wants to move he wants to kind of be be physical i guess so anyway brian wraps up at 15 minutes by saying something about gabby swinging and him pushing her away the irony is right here bear this in mind now the irony is right here if brian had admitted to mistreating gabby gabby wouldn't have died and he wouldn't be dead either if brian had said you know what I um, was wrong, I locked her out the van, you know, it's whatever, whatever. And you can imagine him not in a million years admitting that. But if he did, if he just sort of said, you know what, I'm just going to come clean, I'm just going to be honest, Brian would still be alive, Gabby also would still be alive, and they could live the next decades of their lives, you know, be at least alive. And what he's trying to make sure is that they live happily ever after, but by denying what is really going on meant, as somebody said, they're kind of guaranteeing the opposite, unhappily ever after. So if you think about it, Brian won this little contest against the truth, but it eventually caught up to him. The truth of what was really happening, the truth of what he was really doing, the truth of what he was really feeling eventually caught up to him. In other cases, Chris Watts, Barry Morphew, Laurie Vella, we see, I think, a similar pattern. Someone tries to leave one relationship and graduate to another. They know what the fairy tale is. They know what they're going towards, what they're pursuing. But they don't know how to deal with a nightmare other than to deny it. And that is the formula for all fairy tales to turn into nightmares. So if you're in an escalating situation, things are getting worse, becoming more stressful, more anxious, one of the ways to really deal with it is to just be honest, to say, this isn't good, I'm not happy, this isn't working, etc., etc. And that is painful, but at least you, you then take the, you nip it in the bud, it's not going to get any worse. But to deny it, all those similar driving forces remain in place. Does that make sense? So I'm not going to take it further than that. I will be doing a live stream still on Barry Morphew. I may even do it later tonight. My voice seems to be holding up okay. So uh, look out for that. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.